Hey, hey guys, so I'm going to be reading some more uh, stories. This is going to be a longer one because there is three acts of this particular story. So there's act one, act two, and act three. I believe, hold on real quick. Uh, oh wait, no there's, maybe there's not? Hold on for a second. Wait, what? Oh, this is the prologue. Oh. Hold on, I gotta make sure. This is the prologue. Yeah, I'll read this one first. Sorry about that. Oh, good thing I checked. But we are those who would do you harm. Prologue. Prologue, Wendy. Suggest the tracks, monsters by Matchbolt. Interesting. <clears throat> Wendy ran as fast as she could. She had no time to stop at any of the houses that flew by as she ran. Uh, because she knew the darkness was closing in on her. Besides, this was all her fault. Her grave mistake. Oh, by the way, guys, I'm going to, um, I say I'm going to read this one and then act one. And then I'll wait for act two and act three after. I'll read them later on. Just go about it that way. Okay, anyways. Uh, she had allowed darkness into her life. Hi, hey, baby. Not the baby. Uh, and she doesn't... And she wasn't about to leave it in, into others. Her parents had already paid the price for it. She blinked back tears as she remembered just moments before how she had walked in to find the disemboweled bodies of her parents lying in a heap on the floor. Ooh, gross. It's horrible. And how a dark figure had stepped from the shadows into the moonlight, holding a bloody knife and revealing himself to be... Dot, dot, dot. Wendy shook her head as she continued to run. Now she was, now was not the time... He was coming for her, and she had to lead him as far away from her little hometown as possible. All of her friends and neighbors were there. She could at least save them. When they had resigned herself to her fate, it was what she deserved after all. But how could she have known that, that the one she loved the most would turn out to be someone, something wicked? When they paused to catch her breath, she was standing in front of the cornfield that separated her town from the next one. Wendy thought back again to when she had first met him. She was always drawn to strange people, and the new boy in town definitely fit the bill. Mm, probably not the best way to go. Everyone stayed away from him at school, so she was the only one brave enough to talk to him. It wasn't long before she had fallen hard, and despite everyone, including her best friend, Abby, warning her that he was dangerous, they began dating. See, you should at least listen to people, man. Come on now. Looking back on it now, it seemed like she had cared about him more than he cared about her. It was like he was void of any emotions. But but Wendy didn't have long to remin reminiscence. Reminimize size. I can't pronounce that, sorry. A whizzing sound interrupted her thoughts, and before she could turn around, she felt a sharp pain in her leg. Ah! She moaned as she fell to the ground. Oof. Upon examining her leg, she discovered a small pocket knife protruding from it. Ow, what the? Looking up, she could just make out his silhouette in the distance. He always did have impeccable aim. Oh, God. What are, what are, the, what are the odds, all right? She gritted her teeth, pulled out the knife, tried to stand. Because the knife hit her in the back of the of her knee, she knew that running would now be difficult. She also knew that he knew that as well. The silhouette was getting closer. Wendy forced herself to stand, ignoring the pain, and limped into the cornfields. Glancing over her shoulder, she saw that she was leaving a trail of blood behind. Oh, that's even worse. It would most assuredly lead him straight to her. He must have predicted that as well. Oh well, it didn't matter now. He was away from the town, and her best friend, that's all that mattered. 
Finally, up ahead, she could make out what she was looking for. There was an old abandoned house in the middle of the cornfields. No one knows why it was there. Rumor has it that it had been there ever since the town was first established. It certainly looked hundreds of years old. It also looked similar to a plantation house, only not, not as big. Still, it was pretty big and spooky. No one, as far as Wendy knew, had ever lived there or even had any interest in buying it. She and her friends used to dare each other to spend the night there when they were kids. Who could have known that this would be her final resting place? Since no one bothered to lock the doors, Wendy staggered inside, slamming the door behind her. The pain in her leg was becoming unbearable, and the loss of blood was starting to make her head spin. Wendy collapsed against the wall in the living room and glanced around the empty house. As she waited for him to come, she wondered what she should do. She had come here without a plan, only wanting to lead him away. But what happens after? How could she be sure that he wouldn't simply go back? No, she wouldn't let that happen. She had let the wrong one in, so he was her responsibility. It would all end here. Her head snapped up as the front door slowly opened. She was at the time. Using the window sill next to her, she managed to stand. The silhouette entered and, after locating her, calmly walked in. Wendy pressed her back against the wall and held her breath as he inked closer and closer. The closer he got, the more clearly she could see him, thanks to the light provided by the window. When he was just an arm's length away, she could examine him in his in, in his entirety. The bloody white hoodie, the knife that used that used on her parents, the long black hair covering most of his face. What is what do I get? Why do I I get Jeff the Killer vibes? Wendy wanted to look into his cold black eyes, but he held his head slightly down. Uh, making it difficult, instead, Wendy glanced again at the knife that he gripped in his hand, as if his life depended on it. Jeff. Oh, is this for real Jeff the Killer story? No way. Wendy murmured. Jeff slowly lifted his head. She could only see one eye, but his stare burned into hers. Carefully, she lifted her hand and pushed his hair aside. His face was made out like it always was, like the Joker. Oh, God. She had found his strangeness interesting, but it scared everyone else to look at him. A demented clown is what their schoolmates had called him behind his back. Jeff, she said again, why are you doing this? Tears rolled down her cheeks as memories of their short time together flashed through her mind. I don't understand. What did I do wrong? She went on. I I love you, Jeff. <laughs> you love him? You loved him? Because, okay. I thought you felt the same way. Jeff said nothing. He simply took a step back and raised his knife, preparing to strike. Wendy nodded, realizing that she might never know. All right, Jeff, if this is what you want, just one more kiss before I go. What? One more kiss? What kind of... Before Jeff could respond, she wrapped her arms around his neck and leaned him down for a kiss. His lips were soft. Oh, my God. This is this is insane, bro. Like they had always been, but this kiss was different. He didn't return it. He merely stood there as she embraced him. When they dropped one of her arms to the great leg dig into, a po into her pocket. She gripped the pocket knife that he had thrown at her earlier but did not pull it out. Up until a few moments she wasn't sure if she could even use it on him. Now she was definitely sure that she couldn't no matter what he had done. Really? Come on now. When they let go of him and leaned back against the wall when he studied his face which was now dumbfounded and his breath breath his breathing, sorry, quickened. She couldn't understand why, but it didn't matter. Goodbye, Jeff. When he closed her eyes and waited and waited and waited, after what seemed like forever, she slowly opened her eyes. He was gone, without a word, without a sound. The front door was, was opened wider than it had been before, 
so she was truly alone. Instead of leaving right away, she sank to the floor and wept. Oh my god, what? Uh, I think it was. How old is your brain? By the end of this game, you'll find out the objective of this puzzle. You find out. Shush. Who are those who could harm you? Act one. Act one, Abby. Uh, ooh, track by corn. Nice. Abby didn't know what to do. Since her best friend was now an orphan, she convinced her parents to let Wendy stay with them until they graduated from high school. After that, she was going to move in with her aunt over the summer. Abby's main re reasoning was that Wendy was going to need someone to lean on after such a horrible tragedy. Abby believed that she could be that person. But ever since Wendy moved in, she had started becoming withdrawn from the world around her. Wendy hardly talked to anybody, to anyone. She barely ate, and she often woke up screaming in the middle of the night. She always acted as if someone was following her, watching her, yet she always wanted to be alone. Not to mention her appearance had become startling from lack of sleep and care. When Abby tried talking to her, Wendy just shut her out. Oof. Abby didn't want Wendy to deal with her pain alone, but what could she do? It wasn't like before. When the worst thing that could happen to her was a petty argument with her parents. Her parents. If only they were here. But if they were here, then Abby wouldn't be having this problem. It was all his fault. Oh, how she hated him. For the moment she laid eyes on him, she knew he was in trouble. But when he couldn't see it, all she could see was someone she could try to save. Now it was her who needed saving. And he was still out there. Somewhere. A month after the murderers, on a rainy evening, Abby lay in her bed, across the room from her. When Wendy lay in her own bed, scribbling furiously in a diary she had been keeping. When she finished, she placed it on her side of the bookshelf with her other belongings. Wendy then peeked out of her window and froze for a moment before closing the curtains. She looked over at Abby, who was starting to fall asleep. Abby? Hmm? Remember when we first met in middle school? Yeah? Why? I was just thinking back on my life and how far I've come. I've been trying to write, down, write them all down. All the good memories I have to leave behind after I'm gone. Abby sleepily propped herself up on one elbow to look at her. Gone? Where are you going? When it didn't respond by the way. Nowhere. It was just a figure of speech. Abby stared at her for a minute before collapsing back onto her pillow. Don't scare me like that. They were both silent for a minute. Abby started drifting off to sleep again. When we first met, I was the weird kid, Wendy said, waking Abby up again. I remember how nobody talked to me at first. I spent most of the elementary school alone because I wasn't in the same things as every other kid in my age. Then one day, you spoke to me. Yeah, Abby slurred, trying to remember. I told you I liked your dress, the one with the blue flowers on it. Yep, and we've been best friends ever since. And after that, more friends came. Mm-hmm. I never thanked you for that, for being my friend. You didn't have to thank me. I liked you. I liked the fact that you were different. At least back then you were high school normalize you normalize you. They both chuckled. Yeah, I became normal. Whatever that means. But I was still drawn to weird people. Yeah, Abby yawned. Remember all those guys I dated? When he laughed. Steven Drew. Steven Drew Gary. The guy who was obsessed with chins. Jeff the homicidal psychopath. Wendy was quiet for a moment. Abby sat out and looked at her. I'm sorry, but I can't help being a little mad at you for this. It's been a long enough time since the funerals for me to say that. I know you couldn't have known, but the worst part is that you changed on me. This is the longest conversation we've had since. No, you're right. I haven't been a good friend, and I'm sorry. Abby lay back down. No, don't be sorry. I forgot about the golden heart of yours. 
You could never think think ill of anyone, not even him. He didn't seem dangerous at all while we were dating. When he said in a quiet voice, he was a bit distant and quiet, and I thought he gen- genuinely loved. When he looked up to see that Abby had drifted off to sleep, she got up and walked over to her friend's bed, crouching down in front of her. She took some gray hair behind her ear. Leading down, she went in her ear. Thanks for being my friend. Abby opened her every eyes long enough to see Wendy quietly walk out the room. Wendy, where are you going? She moaned. But sleep overtook her as her vision got blurry and then everything went black. <clears throat> the next morning, Abby woke up to find Wendy's bed empty. In fact, it didn't even look slept in. Abby sat out and tried to remember what happened the previous night. All that talk about looking back on her life and thanking her for being her friend. It almost seemed like she was saying goodbye. Abby searched the house calling her friend's name, but she was nowhere to be found. First, she alerted her parents, then the police, and then the whole town. Some people claimed to have seen her on the night she went missing. But no matter how many search parties were sent out, no matter how much the reward was for any information on her whereabouts, no matter how much Wendy wished, when, no, no matter how much Abby wished, sorry, Wendy remained missing. Two months after her disappearance, Abby noticed that the police were starting to give up. They had no leads and no evidence of any kind. They began treating her as runaway because of her deep depression over the deaths of her parents. Never mind the fact that none of her clothes or other belongings were missing. They didn't even bother to look through them. They assured Abby and her parents that Wendy would return when she was ready, or that she would eventually be found. Abby wasn't convinced, but she couldn't convince anyone else to listen to her. Her mother and her father, her mother and father cared about Wendy very much, but they were tired and wanted to get on with their lives. So Abby had to find her best friend on her own, or at the very least find out what happened to her. Abby decided to start with Wendy's computer. Her boyfriend, Tucker, was an expert hacker. He could hack into just about anything. So when Abby asked if he could come over to try to break into her computer, he was almost insulted that she even asked if he could do it. After they successfully hacked into her computer, they did a wide search, finding nothing suspicious. They decided to check her emails, but even after hacking into it, there were no emails or messages of any sort to give them a clue. Ugh. Abby sat back in her in her chair. Ex. Ex. Expirated. 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 This is hopeless. Don't give up yet, babe. Tucker said, getting on and massaging her neck. I'm sure there's no need for any of this anyway. She'll come back. Yeah. And when she does, I'm going to beat the living crap out of her. Shh, he whispered. He massaged her neck a little bit harder, causing her to moan softly. Okay. Tucker smiled. Hey, I still have half an hour before I have to meet up with with the guys. Your parents are out. Want to fool around a little? Abby leaned her head back to grin at him. I could use some comfort. After he left, Abby straightened herself up and then continued to explore. Wendy's computer continued to floor Wendy's computer, sorry. Looking at her search history, Abby wondered just what was going through her friend's mind before she disappeared. There were searches about night terrors, sleep paralysis, and articles on other recent disappearances happening around town. Abby eventually found herself back in Wendy's email. She hadn't thought before to check the spam folder, so she clicked on it. Abby was shocked to find that there were hundreds of messages in the folder, all from an anonymous email address. Abby clicked on an email, which read, I'm coming for you. Abby was more than a little spooked. She clicked on another one, gonna get you, baby. Abby was frightened, but she clicked on on another one, and another, and another. The more she read, the colder the chill creeping up her spine became. Don't try to run. No one can save you from me. There's no escape. There's nowhere to hide. You'll be mine again. 
You better not tell anyone or they're next. The message is dated all the way back to the day after her parents' funeral. Abby shook her head as hot tears ran down her cheeks. <clears throat> so she had been dealing with this all by herself for so long. No wonder she had changed so much and wouldn't let anyone in. Abby composed herself and clicked down the very first message sent to Wendy. I want you, but we won't be separated for much longer. Jeff is coming. Abby's hand flew to her mouth. Jeff, of course. There was no denying it now. Jeff had something to do with it. But first she needed more proof. Abby quickly wiped away her tears and began to look through all, all of Wendy's things. She looked through her book bag, her side of the closet, closet under her bed and her side of the bookshelf. She flipped through some of her notebooks but she found were messages sloppy, sloppily scrawled by her friend in the markings of almost every page. Jeff is coming. Jeff is coming for me. There's no escape for me. It's all over. I can't run. I can't hide. He won't stop. I had to protect him. No one else needs to die. Jeff. 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 He's coming. She tossed it onto Wendy's bed to give to the police and looked through her other notebooks and textbooks. All the same. How could she have kept it inside all this time? Abby glanced at all the titles un until her eyes rested on Wendy's journal, partly par hidden underneath a world history textbook. Cautiously, she picked it up and read the first entry. Dear Abby, if you are reading this, stop right now. By now, I had probably disappeared. I know you want answers, but it's too dangerous. Just forget about me and move on with your life. You're strong, stronger than I am. But there is evil in this world that even you just can't fight. <clears throat> You'll definitely lose. So you can put this down. In fact, bury it or burn it. It doesn't matter now that I'm gone. I only kept it so that I couldn't stay sane. I wanted to write down everything I could remember about my life so that I wouldn't forget. I wanted to talk to you so badly, but that would have been sealing your doom. I won't make the same mistake twice. Goodbye, Abby. You're my best friend and I love you. Have a great life. Love, Wendy. After a few moments of uncontrollable sob sobbing, Abby wondered why she left the journal behind if it was so dangerous. Maybe she didn't get the opportunity, the opportunity to get rid of it. Abby stared at the journal, conflicted about whether or not to continue reading. She decided to take the chance. She flipped to the next page, but it was just an entry about her earliest memory. It went on like that for the first half of the journal, as if she were trying to write down every single memory of her life that she could remember. Even the memory of when they first met was there. Abby smiled as she tried to blink back tears, but then it took a dark turn. When it began the red bed nightmare that she had she had been having, one about a pale-faced figure chasing her through the cornfields. Abby had heard about that night when Wendy was telling the police about her parents' murder. She remembered feeling infuriated about the fact that the police couldn't find the killer, even though he was just a teenage boy. The intrigue continued. Apparently, Wendy sometimes couldn't sleep at night because she heard noises outside the window. Sometimes when she thought she was alone, she could feel like someone was watching her, but when she looked, no one, no one was there. But there was someone there, and confirmed by the messages she was receiving. There was even a time when she actually saw him. It was a cold night, about a week before she disappeared. She had gotten up to close the window when she saw him. He was standing outside their window with his hood up, head held down. Since their bedroom was on the second floor, he couldn't reach her. Still, he slowly lifted his head and locked eyes with her. <clears throat> when they gasped at the sight of his face, but she didn't turn away. They stayed like that for what seemed like hours. But when Abby shifted in bed, blissfully unaware of any danger, when they turned to make sure she was still asleep. When she turned back to the window, he was gone. If she knew it was him, then why did she gasp when she saw his face? Abby wondered aloud. She sank down onto the bed, so he was so he was here this whole time, yet no one even knew. No wonder Wendy felt so alone. Abby continued to flip through the journal, reading about many more mysterious things happening to her and about Wendy's depression and loneliness. 
But it wasn't until she got to the back of the book that Abby shrieked. The Abby shrieked, sorry, and let the book slip from her hands. Abby dropped to the floor and slowly opened the book again. On the back cover of the journal was a sketch of Jeff, dated the week before when he disappeared. But this was no ordinary portrait. He still wore the Joker makeup, but his face was now horribly mutilated. His eyelids, nose, and lips were all missing. The only color on the picture was the area around his mouth where Wendy had scribbled in red ink. And underneath his picture, also written in red, was one last message. Message, sorry. Jeff is here. Ooh, that's brutal. I oh, hope you guys enjoyed that so far. I I haven't heard a Jeff the Killer story in a long time. This is actually pretty cool. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. As always, stay safe and take care. And I will read some more later on. Bye-bye.